Yes, thanks for coming after the tag party. Um, I'm in the lucky position of having three young children, so actually I can go to the tag party and get up at seven and it's still the best night's sleep I've had in quite a while. So, uh, yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, sustainability, complexity and urbanism and this kind of concept that um, I've been kind of noodling about with, with colleagues from uh, Arizona State, Mike Smith and others who might be familiar to some of you with urbanism studies, uh, of settlement persistence um, and particularly that around Southwest Asia. And the kind of impetus for that um, is thinking about uh, modern urban sustainability. So modern cities, um, as this kind of quite nice quote from Reese and Mackinacle is saying, is uh, nodes of energy and material consumption, they're causally linked to the accelerating global ecological design, uh, decline. Sorry. But at the same time, cities and their inhabitants can play a major role in helping to achieve global sustainability. And it's kind of... Um, traditional at this point to say sometime between 2005 and 2010, 50% of the world's people lived in cities for the first time. Now that quote is a, or that, um, what should we call it to be charitable, a factoid, um, may be entirely bullshit. And it's a bit complicated to, to actually articulate that because it's based on UN uh, national data where different countries define their cities in very different ways. But it probably happened and it, it's definitely that's the direction of travel, right? Cities are a big deal and they're not going away in our kind of urban, in our global trajectory. So why is that um, significant? Well, um, cities are um, obviously by definition almost a high population in a small space. They're a high density uh, environment for people to live in and that has positives and negatives. So in positives, it's efficient for, for things like transport and infrastructure, but also more kind of intangible things like social interaction. Um, I don't know if people are aware of the kind of um, cities as social reactors um, model, whereby things like if you have a city with a million people and a city with two million people, the city with a million people will have 100 miles of pipe. The city with two million people will have 180 miles. So you save on infrastructure, even though you've expanded the population. And conversely, the opposite is true for kind of social stuff. So if you look at the same sorts of things like uh, patents or even like things like numbers of friends people have, it scales the other way. So a city with a million people, you might have 100 patents per year. A city with 2 million people will have 220. So it's not double, it's more than double. So cities do something kind of magical. Like they overproduce with under levels of infrastructure. But they also have massive negative connotations that we can all see in in urban um, situations around the world. So they produce big ecological stress on their local environment. They have complicated provisioning requirements. You've got to get loads of stuff into the center of that urban population area. And you get you know, a lot of waste, a lot of pollution, other kinds of things to, to contend with. So they have all these positives, but they also have potential negatives as well. And of course, ancient cities faced very similar problems. And actually some of that urban scaling work that's, that's um, looked at those sorts of um, numbers has actually been done on ancient cities in, in different ways and, and shown that they operate in similar kinds of ways. So how can archaeology contribute to this? We had a long discussion about this in the climate change session yesterday. Um, and one of the things that I think we have a problem with archaeologically is, is defining sustainability over time and also finding kind of archaeological correlates for understanding it. Um, so the kind of definition of sustainability that's most commonly cited is this one from the Brundtland Commission. So um, a UN report from 1987, sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, which is kind of nice, but quite woolly as a definition. Um, and it's also, it's quite hard to think, okay, well, how could we actually test that archeologically? Like what, what would we look for in the archeological record in our material remains that we could sort of see if that was happening? to kind of try and identify sustainable practices. It's quite difficult to think about it. People like Joe Tainter have thought about this too um, and get a bit more kind of, as an archeologist should, get a bit closer to kind of what we could actually do archeologically. So the ability to keep or maintain by furnishing the necessities of life. And that's also kind of interesting. Um, but again, it's still, it's still quite difficult to kind of get purchase on. So some recent work by Mike Smith um, have cited um, Costanza and Patton, 1995. Um, a sustainable system is one which survives or persists. So they introduced this concept of persistence, which is great for archaeologists because actually we're really good at that, right? Because what we're doing here is looking at um, essentially something that if something keeps going, we're assuming that it faces a series of challenges as it goes along, whether it's a city or a society or something like that. But if it's able to persist and to keep going and to endure in the same kind of way, then it must, by definition, be capable of dealing with those challenges and therefore it's being sustainable. 
Now, there's some, there's some problems with that, which I won't go into now. I'm just going to take it as read, and we can maybe argue about it in the discussion session. But the reason why it's quite good as well is because we can do this kind of thing quite easily in archaeology. So we can look at the duration of occupation and assume that that is a measure of sustainability. And if we do that versus other kinds of variables, um, then we can think about what sort of enables persistence and durability and sustainability to happen, if we can try and do this. So I'm going to quickly look at land use and time, which we might associate with social complexity, and I'll explain that in a sec, and then city size very quickly. So there's three pages of graphs. Um, don't get too worried. Also, I'm doing this in Southwest Asia, um, so the kind of traditional of the Middle East, which is a really useful and interesting place to think about this kind of stuff. So we have a really, really long history of urbanism, about 6,500 years of, of sort of true cities, as it were, um, but also a much longer history of, of kind of large, weird settlements that are bigger than the things around them that we can have a think about. It's a diverse environment and a kind of semi-arid environment. So you've got lots of different types of land use and ways of living and organization. So you can see how those different cities in different zones, for example, um, manage to persist through time. That can tell us about what they need to, to be able to do that. You've got some rapid climate change events and, and some long-term drying trends, which I won't go into too much um, today. But what you've really got here is, um, well, I like this quote from Jackson et al, a series of kind of completed experiments. You've got a whole bunch of cities that emerged and then uh, persisted for a while and then fell to bits for various different reasons. And so thinking about why that could be the case is, is really interesting. So what's my data set? Um, so I took a, my study area, the, um, the whole of Mesopotamia in the northern Levant. So that's an area a bit larger than England, not much larger. Um, and what I took is every single site that's over 10 hectares in size from 10,000 BC to 0 AD. Um, so 10,000 BC gives us sort of the first um, early farming sites that get quite big quite quickly. Um, and 0 AD, I stopped there because you get into this classical world where there's lots of cities and it's all a bit complicated. And also because the, a lot of the cities that are still there today and haven't sort of died yet uh, are coming about in that classical period or just after. So it gets difficult to understand persistence because they're still persisting, so I haven't got an endpoint. So the whole data set gives us about um, just under 500 sites, and lots of them are occupied multiple times, so you get up to kind of um, nearly 700 occupation phases. In doing that, I'm doing some violence to the uh, diversity and interesting things that are going on in urbanism at this point over this long period, right? So you've got all sorts of different things going on. You've got um, some examples of, so at the top, you've got very, very long-lived, that it looks like a hill, it's actually a long-lived city at Tel Brac. You've got sites like Mari, which are very, have a particular um, kind of all clear organization. And you've got smaller sites that are still 10 hectares, like Talamana, which is actually a very long-lived Neolithic site for a very long time. And then in the southern Mesopotamia, you've got these kind of incredible sort of um, uh, massive, massive sort of low density bits and pieces, bit kind of urbanism sites. So I'm crushing all of these together into one just to kind of try and understand what's going on. But again, we can, we can pick that apart later. So the other thing I'm using is um, this model of land use that we've been developing for the Land Cover 6K project, um, which is basically a completely different thing about trying to work out uh, what, the land, what land use was like globally at a series of events over the Holocene. And what we've been doing to, to do that is basically um, dividing up the uh, Fertile Crescent region into different zones using a series of different parameters. So I won't go too much into this, but essentially the parameters are things like digital elevation, um, soil data, rainfall, um, and then kind of irrigation and modeling and stuff like that. So what that gives us, Again, we can talk about this. I'm kind of blasting through this because I'm aware of the 15 minute issue. But um, what that gives us is this kind of basic affordance map of, or kind of um, functional niche map to put it in, in niche construction theory idea that uh, this is what you could do in this kind of environment, the optimal thing to do in each of these zones. Um, and it's based on a, a classification system that's designed to be global. So you go from kind of missing data to no land use, minimal land use, right up to kind of irrigated land use and um, where you get very high levels of productivity. So I'm just using this as a kind of heuristic um, device to then, um, to then divide up my cities and think about whether land use makes a difference to, to um, persistence or not. And it turns out it does, so that's nice. Um, so this is the first of yeah, three graphs. I'm gonna try and explain this. Um, I'm aware graphs and presentations are always a bit crap, um, and especially at TAG, it's a risk. So what I thought I'd do is just put them up and then try and explain them in detail. So what you're looking at here is a, um, each of these along the bottom is uh, a kind of land use. And then up the side, you've got the duration of occupation. 
And what I've done basically, so that's duration. And you're going from kind of very nice irrigated high productivity landscapes to right over there, the most horrible um, desert, desert landscapes. And what you can see basically is that, so each of these is a group of cities that are in the marshes or in the agriculture irrigated area. And then I've just um, amalgamated them all and made a box plot of what they, uh, their duration, right? And the line in the middle is the mean. And what you can see is um, a few surprising things. Firstly, it's all quite um, similar, which I was quite surprised about, right? So even cities in really, really horrible places seem to be persisting for quite a long time. But, and there is a sort of general trend between sort of 400 and 1,000 years is about roughly where all the means are, which again is quite interesting. So in the really nice areas, what you get is um, quite decent persistence. That's the, these two over here are the kind of agriculture optimal kind of areas. And these two are the more irrigated areas where actually you get some of the lowest levels of persistence. So the highest levels of productivity have the shortest lived cities, which is quite surprising and, and interesting. And I'll come back to that. But then they start to do things that we would expect. So you get kind of in quite nice areas in northern Mesopotamia, you get pretty high levels of persistence. And then weirdly, in the really marginal areas, like really marginal actually, like where not even today many people live, you do get some cities, um, and they tend to be quite long-lived. And I think what's happening there is that in those environments, you get very small, uh, very minimal levels of minimal areas where you can possibly live, right? You get like a karstic sink or an oasis or something like that. And so what you do is you always live there because you can't move around in that environment. So if you have a city and it needs to be there for a trade route or something, it's going to be quite persistent because it's going to stick in the same place and you can't move. And then you get kind of um, more episodic exploitation in, in more riskier areas. So this is um, some work we've been doing around this idea of the zone of uncertainty, which sounds kind of cool, like the Bermuda Triangle, but it's really just an area where there's mixed levels of rainfall and it's a bit kind of fluctuating. So what you get is a kind of pulse of settlement every now and again into that area. And so you get relatively low levels of persistence. Persistence through time was quite surprising too. Um, so what we've got here is um, the same thing with the box plots and duration. And along the bottom, you're moving from 10,000 years ago or more. Um, and then it's by millennium right down to the um, first millennium BCE. Um, and obviously, you've got quite a clear trend. Um, that's where we get the kind of earliest true cities, right? Like kind of Uruks of this world, Telbraks of this world. And what you've essentially got is a, it's quite a steep decline um, in, uh, yeah, in, in the persistence of these cities, which is quite interesting. And by the time you get to the kind of uh, territorial empires, kind of very large polities, actually cities, are, they kind of move around quite significantly and quite often, especially relative to earlier periods. Um, which again, is quite interesting to think about, especially if we're saying, broadly speaking, in the Middle East, and, and again, people could argue with this, but there's a kind of um, a trajectory towards greater complexity through time, certainly at a millennial scale, right? You've got bigger and bigger cities, more and more trade, more and more complicated polities going on, and it seems to have an effect on, on persistence. And finally, sorry, I, I promised three graphs, but there's four because there's two on this one. But anyway, this is looking at um, persistence and just something very basic, which is site size through time. Um, and again, you can see it's more difficult to see, but we do have some sort of minor patterns here. So you're looking at, um, again, duration of occupation here, and then the actual, each of these dots is a site. And then I just box plotted it again in kind of bins, so 10 to 20 hectares, 20 to 50, 50 to 100 and 100 plus. Um, and what you can kind of see is that um, there's a trend um, such that, uh, essentially, larger sites seem to persist for um, longer. It's quite a subtle trend and not too clear. But that's also quite interesting relative to that complexity issue, because actually we know that sites get bigger through time. So those, there's something funny going on there, but it's quite interesting to think about. So the largest sites, the most central sites, as it were, seem to be um, the most persistent. So what does that all mean? Um, well, I think. Um, well, I would say, I would say this obviously, but thinking about um, persistence has potential because we can see quite clear patterns in some of these um, data sets. And in terms of looking kind of persistence enhancing properties, um, it's clear that high agricultural productivity does make a difference in some areas. Um, and low agricultural productivity, if you're in the right place, right? So if you've got a very low agricultural area, then you've got a city and it might actually last for a long time because there's a reason it's there. And it seems like large size is better as well. So these are kind of interesting, if we're thinking about modern stuff, modern day practices, that's quite good, right? We've got really massive cities now, um, and we've got cities in a variety of different areas. 
What's a bit more worrying is that um, you get this kind of declining persistence as societies get more complex. Um, and what we can see with those kind of irrigated landscapes is that you get lower persistence in landscapes which require kind of significant investment and management. So if you've got all these canals and things, these irrigated um, sort of networks that are managing and, and you need them for your city to operate, that actually seems to lower your persistence. Now, I was quite surprised about that. People have written kind of in two different ways about this. One is to say, if you've got an irrigation network, you're kind of buffered against um, problems if anything occurs, right? You can manage it, blah, blah, blah. And the other is to say, if you're um, reliant on a particular system, then when things change, you're not that sustainable, right? So if you've got an irrigation system that is reliant on river levels being of a certain kind or the river being in a certain place, and you get some kind of massive avulsion of a river, which in southern Mesopotamia is quite common, um, at least on a millennial scale, then suddenly you're really quite screwed, actually, right? Because you've got your whole system is based on this one possibility. And I think we can say that we're kind of coming down to on that side rather than the side that says you're locked in place by irrigation, you're locked in place by a particular thing, and so you have high levels of persistence. Thinking about those in terms of like modern societies, I mean, that's a bit distressing, right? So the more complex a society and the more it relies on landscape investment and organization, the more fragile it is. And we live in a society which is comfortably the most of all of those things there has ever been. Um, so I won't leave you with that. Uh, there's also, yeah, obviously this kind of slight tension with site size, right? That increasing complexity normally means bigger cities, um, but they seem to be the most persistent. So what actually, there's something to tease out here, and I haven't really got into the data yet, but it looks like what happens then is that you get big kind of state capitals or cities or economic centers that then middle around, very near the end. So future directions, lots to unpick, um, but we can, if we use kind of persistence on the y-axis, then there's lots of other things that we can put on the x-axis to have a think about. So policy size, production and consumption, networks and infrastructure inequality as well. I think Toby and, um, and uh, Adam are going to talk about that later. We can also think about persistence across exogenous events, so across things like an event like the 4.2K event or let's say a climate event or an earthquake or something like that. What happens before and after? Um, and we can use persistence to think about that too. Um, and finally, it'd be really useful, I think, and uh, this is why it was quite interesting to talk to, to a kind of urban audience here, but we routinely report things like site size, but we never really talk about duration in the same kind of way. We always say, you know, my site's, you know, half as big as the Hunaberg and double the size of Ibrax, something like that, but we never say, and it lasts this long, compared to, say, Tripidia sites or Telbrac or whatever. And it'd be interesting to think about that and to, ve to develop a kind of, um, it's just the sort of assumption that that's the thing we can do as well. So I'll finish there. Thanks very much. <laughs>